Hi, Dr. Marshall. Hi, Daryl. How are you? I'm good. I hope you are too. Um, so thank you for coming to the conference. Thank you for being part of this and sharing your time with us. Um, can, can you tell us what kind of doctor you are and where you work? Yeah, I'm a medical oncologist specializing in prostate cancer, and I'm at Johns Hopkins ah. in Baltimore, Maryland. So you see patients every day or what? Uh, no, I see patients um, once a week in the clinic, and then most of the time I spend doing research. Great. And most of your patients, I imagine, are in advanced stage prostate cancer? Yeah, pretty much all of them. The patients who have localized prostate cancer usually see the surgeons and the radiation oncologists, and then those who have progression after those treatments usually come to see us. So today, it would be interesting to talk about all the different drugs and therapies and opportunities for new stuff within the next year or two that uh, folks who are listening in can take advantage of. And there are so many of them, you know, I think a, a good question to start with is like, how do you make sense of it all? You know, how do you figure out which ones to take, when to take them? Uh, meaning like you take one and then when that stops working, you take another or do you take three or four at the same time. How do, how, do, how do you figure that all out? Yeah, so we can go through that and I'll start, um, I'll share my screen in a minute, but I'll start by going through the stages of the disease. Sure. And I'll start where, um, where patients usually start seeing me. So let me share my screen here. Okay, are you able to see my slides? Yeah, very good. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to start with non-metastatic disease or biochemical recurrent disease because, again, this is usually when um, patients enter in to see us in medical oncology. Um, so this is when patients have completed local therapy, again, with either surgery or radiation. And although the intent of treatment is initially curative, the PSA is rising, and that's indicative of ongoing uh, prostate cancer. So what's the treatment paradigm in this setting? I will say that this is a pretty controversial area um, within prostate cancer treatment right now, um, especially in light of new imaging modalities and sort of how we define metastatic disease. Um, but for the most part, we still use conventional imaging, which is just a CT abdomen pelvis and a nuclear medicine bone scan. And if those are negative or do not show any um, evidence of metastatic disease, then we consider patients to have non-metastatic prostate cancer or biochemical recurrent disease. So what can you do um, if you're in that setting? So one um, option is observation, and uh, certainly many people can choose this, and this is just where um, you do not opt for any treatment at this point, but you continue to monitor the PSA um, and continue to get uh, imaging every so often, depending sort of on what the PSA level is and, and how quickly it's rising. Another option for treatment is intermittent androgen deprivation therapy or continuous androgen deprivation therapy. So this is when um, androgen deprivation therapy or ADT, um, which is usually a shot that's given once every either one month or three months or six months. Um, and intermittent means that it's given for a six to 10 month period and then it's stopped. Um, and continuous would be when you continue to uh, take the medicine indefinitely. If you don't mind, if I could ask questions while we're looking at the slides rather than waiting till the end, you yeah, know, please. if that's okay. So like, rise. let's start with rising PSA. I mean, many guys wonder like, you know, they start out, you know, post-surgery radiation, year three years, four years out. You know, PSA is like uh, 0. 0.00 something you know, point zero X. At what point is uh, a, a, a post-initial treatment guy thinking of himself as having a rise in PSA? Yeah, so um, it depends a little bit on if you have surgery or radiation. So if you have surgery and you have the prostate removed, then we expect your PSA to be undetectable. And there are also a couple different PSA assays. So sometimes um, some laboratories have the ultra sensitive PSA where it's measured um, to much lower levels. Ours and our lab here is um, a P PSA of less than 0 0.1. We don't get a value lower than that. So um, for us, your PSA has to be over 0 0.1 for us to even be able to detect it. 
Um, if someone has had surgery and they have a rising PSA, even when it's still below one, um, those patients are uh, sometimes eligible for salvage radiation. Let's assume that you've gone through all of the local treatment options. Um, if people start having rising PSAs, again, it depends um, not so much on the number per se, um, although if the PSA is starting to get above 10, then we do worry about the onset of metastatic disease. Um, but we also look at the rate of rise. So if it's rising very rapidly, then that would maybe make us think more about treatment earlier rather than if it was rising very, very, very slowly. Right. And like the, uh, the rate of it rising or the acceleration or velocity or however the different ways uh, different doctors and different patients describe it. Is that sort of something that's more exciting and useful to understand after initial treatment rather than prior to initial treatment? Yeah, so we use it um, in the setting. So what we use is called the PSA doubling time and you can actually go online and there are calculators online where you can put in your PSA value and the date that it was drawn. Um, and you can calculate your own PSA doubling time. Um, so yeah, so we use it after um, local treatment um, has occurred um, to think about then, you know, what we should do or um, also some, some of our clinical trials in this space also require that you have a certain doubling time in order to be eligible. Right, uh, and good. Um, what I, I didn't ask clearly then, it, I mean, is it like doubling times more sort of treacherous? If you have, if you have a, short, a brief doubling time comparable to the brief doubling time you might've had or, you know, earlier in this, you know, before you had initial treatment. I mean, is it more of a scary uh, situation? Should people be more concerned post-treatment about doubling time or it's sort of still, you know, the PSA is the PSA and we're just watching what the numbers tell us? Yeah, I, I would not compare a post-treatment PSA doubling time to a pre-treatment PSA doubling time. Um, you know, especially if you've gotten treatment in the interim, um, because, you know, the normal prostate also has, makes PSA in the absence of cancer. So, um, you know, a PSA doubling time or even PSA values that you would have had pre-treatment are not necessarily directly comparable to doubling times and values after the local therapy. Yeah. And, and one of the ways to think, are, uh, so what do you think of this? When patients say one of the ways to figure out when to start worrying after initial treatment is like, if you got zeros after your decimal point on your PSA reading, you're okay. When you start losing those uh, zeros, then start paying attention. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, and I think the other easy thing or, you know, just way to maybe um, make it easier. Or one of the things that I tell my patients too is because um, sometimes patients come to see me when their PSA is five and sometimes people come to see me when it's 0.5 or 0 0.05. Um, and all of those are appropriate times to connect with a, a medical oncologist or, or a doctor. Um, but then usually we'll just determine the follow-up based on that. So the person who has a PSA of five, um, you know, would I would probably be checking in with more frequently than the person who has a PSA of 0 0.05, for example. Now, around intermittent versus continuous androgen deprivation therapy, um, how do you figure out uh, which to choose, which method to, uh, you know, I guess, timeline to choose? Yeah, so um, that, again, depends a lot on the patient. Um, so patient preference plays into this. Uh, any comorbidities or other diseases that um, you know the the person might have that might be complicated complicated by this treatment, um, and then also you know some of the PSA dynamics that we talked about before. So there's no like one way to understand. I mean, there's no. I mean, now that we're many years, several years into under, into seeing intermittent uh, in play in in real world. It, it, there's, we still don't know whether there's really uh, a reliably better outcome one way or the other. 
Uh, well, intermittent ADT and continuous ADT have been compared to each other, and there wasn't a clear survival benefit for um, for one over the other. Um, so that's why intermittent androgen deprivation therapy is still a very reasonable option, and many people choose that because then they won't have the side effects from ADT for as long. Cool. Cool. Okay. All right. So. Um, Let's go on. So for the people who have chosen um, androgen deprivation therapy in this rising PSA non-castrate level, if they have progression, um, that's what we consider, if they're still non-metastatic by conventional imaging, that's what we consider non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, meaning that your PSA is rising even though the, your testosterone is suppressed um, and there's no uh, metastatic disease on conventional imaging. So. Um, in the past couple of years, actually, we have three new treatments for patients who have this disease. Um, they're all oral medications and they're all anti-androgens, so they target the androgen axis. Um, they're apalutamide, enzalutamide, and darolutamide. So these would be the, the treatment options. And again, what, um, you know, how you pick between these in this setting really depends on um, the side effects profile of, of some of these medications, sometimes the cost, because they can be very expensive and insurance doesn't necessarily cover all of them uh, the same or, you know, for any individual patient, the cost may be different. Um, but these are the three options for, for this setting. So from your experience, I mean, like if you if cost aside and access equal, um, which would you choose as a first line therapy? Um, so in some of the studies, it seems like darolutamide is the one associated with the least amount of toxicities. So um, this tends to be the one that, that I choose, but again, it depends a lot on, um, you know, some of the, the patient characteristics. Right. And by toxicities around darolutamide, um, patients are savvy to this uh, brain blood barrier thing. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so darolutamide is lower than some of the other ones, so like um, has less fatigue than some of the other drugs. Um, and then enzalutamide also has this rare risk of seizures associated with it, um, which does not seem to be the case with darolutamide. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, when you, and just quickly, what are the brand names for each of these? That actually, I don't remember. <laughs> oh, because, I, well, you and me, I mean, had I, I mean, I, if I knew offhand, but I mean, it's so early in the morning while we're doing this and it's like, uh, I just can't think of them anyway, but I hope I those, exactly everyone who's watching, look it up and write it somewhere. If we have an area for comments, I'm not sure if we will, but you know, put it in there, you know. Help help everyone at Johns Hopkins out and at Mailcare out to tell us what the brand names for these are. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't use the brand names, so I don't I don't remember all of them, and sometimes I have to look them up myself. Yeah. All right. Uh, um, go ahead. Okay. So um, for patients who um, have not started ADT for biochemical recurrent disease, um, and also for those patients who present with de novo metastatic disease, so. That means that patients were never diagnosed with localized disease, but the time of diagnosis, they're found to have metastatic disease. So these are the treatment options. So first, um, ADT or androgen deprivation therapy is started continuously. Um, and then there are other options to add to ADT. So therapies that have been studied and demonstrated to be efficacious include docetaxel, which is chemotherapy, and then uh, three oral uh, anti-androgen. So that's abiraterone, which gets given in combination with prednisone, enzalutamide, and apalutamide. So these would be the treatment options for um, metastatic disease. Again, this is by conventional imaging and in patients who have non-castrate levels of testosterone when they start. Okay. Do you want to keep going? Yeah, actually, um Good, good that you post. Uh, Oglio-metastatic, where does that fit in between non-metastatic and metastatic, and how does a patient know that? The, sorry, say that one more time. Oh, uh, so oh, some patients are described as 
I'll, I oh, mispronounced yes, it. Oh, yes, it says oligometastatic disease. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, that depends. So, I mean, those patients for the most part are considered, uh, you know, having metastatic disease. Um, sometimes we do add in uh, radiation or we'll try um, androgen deprivation therapy alone with uh, radiation just to the metastatic lesions. There have been some studies looking at um, that as a promising option. Um, I've even had some patients do radiation alone without androgen deprivation therapy. Um, but there are clinical trials. So for the most part, I would say um, that patients should probably try and be, you know, do that or do some of the novel treatments in the context of a clinical trial. Um, if, you know, outside of these sort of established paradigms. And all the while you're monitoring PS, you're doing, you're drawing blood, uh, occasionally you're imaging, um, I mean, but that's really all there, I mean, all that's available now to sort of determine progression outside of what the patient's reporting. Is that Correct. Right? Yeah. So, right. So there are a couple of different ways that patients can have progression. Clinical progression, as you mentioned, meaning if the patient's feeling worse, either with, you know, increased bone pain is one of the more common symptoms that patients will have um, from progression of prostate cancer. Um, PSA progression, meaning that the PSA is rising despite whatever therapy the person is taking. Um, and then there's radiographic progression, meaning that there are either new lesions like new tumors that we see on scans or the, um, the tumors that we saw on scans before getting bigger. So those are sort of the three main ways that people can have progression of their disease. So in your slide, I see first line, second line, all the way to line X, which I mean, wouldn't be infinity in this case, but it would be what line three or four, I guess, or, I mean, how do you figure these things out? Yeah, so some of this depends and we can start with um, first line therapy for castration resistant disease. So again, this is after patients have been on ADT and, and once in the metastatic setting, uh, ADT has started, it's really never stopped. Um, so ADT continues throughout all of these. And then the question is just, what are you adding on to ADT and when are you adding it on um, to that backbone of ADT? So in this first line, docetaxel chemotherapy can be used, um, especially if it had been used previously. Cipulosal T is um, like sort of an immune-based uh, therapy. It's an autologous cell product. So um, your blood gets drawn, your white blood cells are taken and activated outside of your body and then reinfused, and you get that three times. Um, so that's typically used early in the disease course. Um, and then enzalutamide and abiraterone, like we talked about before, which are oral agents and can be used um, at this side, at this time. Again, some of this depends on, um, you know, what you would previously received, if, if anything, um, and also, you know, what your tolerance is for, for side effects. And also, you know, docetaxel is IV chemotherapy where you have to come into clinic. Cipulosal T requires coordination um, with, I mean, here we do it with, in coordination with the um, Red Cross and enzalutamide and abiraterone are, are pills that can be taken at home. Um, so those are the sort of pre-chemo um, options. Post docetaxel, which I consider, or I have here at least as second line therapy, um, are cabazitaxel, which is another taxine-based chemotherapy that's approved for use after someone has gotten docetaxel. Enza Abbey can also be used again here. And then radium-223, which is an alpha emitting radiopharmaceutical agent that's given IV every four weeks for six doses. And this is for people who have bone predominant prostate cancer. So people who have uh, like lymph node disease or visceral disease in their liver, for example, uh, wouldn't benefit from radium-223. And how many lines do you typically go through with a patient before they pass away? Um, so it's a, I mean, it depends on a lot of factors. I can't even, um, you know, it, yeah, it depends on a lot of factors. I don't know that there's like a, a number that I have sort of in my mind because it depends a lot on, on when people have presented and when people have started therapy. 
um, and a lot of their disease characteristics, meaning how aggressive the disease is. Um, so it, it can it can vary. Yeah. And at this at this level of treatment, do you, do you pay attention? Do you see significance to racial disparities and presentation around uh, staging based on initial staging with black men sort of presenting at higher uh, stages than white men typically? Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's been demonstrated, but it seems like um, more recently, and it's not entirely clear why this may be, but it's it's thought that maybe some changes in PSA screening practices. We're actually seeing more people in general present with metastatic disease, um, meaning that the first time that they uh, are diagnosed with prostate cancer, they already have metastatic disease. Um, so we have seen an uptick overall in, in men presenting with metastatic disease. Um, so they would have been bypassing this uh, clinically localized and rising PSA stage. Right. And for those guys, a more aggressive approach or a similar kind of uh, set of considerations? Um, so, uh, you know, again, it depends a little bit on the, on the tumor characteristics, um, but those people will usually get... Um, upfront therapy with androgen deprivation therapy plus something else. Um, either chemotherapy if they have, oh, sorry, if, if chemotherapy if they, um, you know, have a lot of bone mats uh, or one of the oral agents. Those patients don't usually uh, present with like what's considered oligometastatic disease, um, although it's certainly possible that they present with, you know, just a couple of, of lesions outside of the prostate. Um, the oligometastatic patients tend to be the ones who've been closely followed for a long period of time and, you, and you're and you doing frequent PSA checks and imaging checks. Um, but so a lot of the, the people who are seeing with de novo metastatic disease um, have more widespread disease and wouldn't be considered oligometastatic. And could you just briefly uh, define, what, is, what do you mean by de novo? Oh, so what, the first time that they're presenting, they have metastatic disease. Right. So I guess the long, the short story for this very long, complex story is there are like there's a uh, a chemo kind of thing like the taxotere, taxol, tax, uh, approach. There's like uh, molecules that interfere with different behaviors. Uh, there's the radium stuff that sort of uh, works at bones at a bone level, bone structure. Uh, and then there's the immunotherapy thing. All of these things are, I mean, are just mind boggling for people to sort of grasp when they're grasping the idea that uh, death is a lot nearer than they otherwise expected. And there may be discomfort from, you know, just pain and fatigue, which typically is the more prominent complaint of guys in our support group network throughout the United States, no matter where they live or who they are. Uh, but this is really not so much for, pay I mean, so your thoughts on what I'm about to say. Is this really about patients trying to figure this out and then engage in quasi urologically intellectual conversations with their doctor? Or is it about feeling comfortable with the doctor sharing their life goals, their current quality of life, their desires for relief from symptom X, Y, or Z? and you know what their life is really about and what they want it to continue to be about and then to engage in another 15 or 20 minutes of conversation as to what you know mix or combination or single therapeutic pathway might be best to achieve those goals yeah so i i think the second part is is what's the right way to approach it and at least the way that i approach it so um, you know, I think it's very important and even early on, you know, at first diagnosis to talk to your doctor about what's important and what your goals are um, and, and what you're hoping for uh, on this, you know, process and, and in this journey. And there are some things that and some side effects that may be intolerable to people that would be fine for other people and, and you know, some situations or um, you know, some people may say, I, you know, I, I don't care what you give me, but I don't want chemotherapy. Um, but sort of 
your your goal, the patient's goals are, are really at the center of this. Um, and certainly quality of life. And like I mentioned before, the other um, disease processes or, or comorbid diseases that we would need to think about are, are front and center. So like when I'm talking to patients and making some of these decisions, I don't pull up this PowerPoint. I don't usually say, you know, here are the five treatment options that we have. Sometimes I'll say there are many treatment options and I'll tell them, you know, based on your goals or this and that, um, you know, this is usually my, my recommendation. Sometimes there are one or two therapies that, you know, I think would be reasonable. And then, and then we talk more in depth about, um, you know, the, the one or two options that, that may be reasonable, but um, you know, usually I always start with where the patient is and, and what the patient is thinking and what they're hoping for. Um, and then I tailor the therapeutic options to, to that. Yeah, no, I mean, that's good because I mean, one, uh, one thing I hope people who are listening, you know, uh, take away is that, yeah, I mean, seeing all these names and, and having, you know, brochures written by pharma and, you know, different companies sitting in the waiting room or not, or being distributed by other organizations, um, those are anxiety producing, whether we realize it or not, you know, I mean, to have to sort uh, you know, swim your way through all these multi-syllable opportunities for treatment is, is not really a solo job. It's not on a patient's shoulders. It's not on their family member's shoulders if they're lucky to have family. You know, it's not on the spouse or partner's shoulder. You know, whoever, you know, is like, you know, the information seeker in the family, if there is someone or yourself, it's really a comp, it's, it's just another way to have, it's more stuff for a doctor to play around with, to figure out how to make you happy and live longer. And, you know, all these different things, you know, are, are in fact different, which makes it incumbent on a patient to sort of uh, feel comfortable in conversation with the doctor, because the doctor is the one that's basically gone through the literature to figure out what the differences are and how to apply them to meet the patient's goals, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, you know, not all of these therapies are even appropriate, um, you know, for an individual patient at a, at a given time. So, um, you know, again, if somebody had significant side effects from one treatment, then that might mean that the next treatment really shouldn't be an offered or an, an option. Um, you know, or if somebody has like some major competing illness, um, some of these, you know, would really, would, would not necessarily benefit the patient. So, you know, even though this is sort of like the theoretical framework and everything that we, all of the tools that we have, but, you know, we sort of have to think about um, the situation in front of us to think about, you know, which tool might be the right one to use. Sure. Can we go to your next slide, please? Yes. Okay, so there are two special populations um, in, in prostate cancer that I just wanna bring up so that people know because um, this might be something that's uh, talked about. Um, I mean, I, I see a lot of the advertisements for these drugs on TV, um, so it comes up then sometimes too, but also doctors are bringing this up uh, frequently too. So um, the first is, is DNA repair mutations in prostate cancer. Um, we're learning more and more about the genetics of prostate cancer and more and more patients are undergoing genetic testing. So um, somatic mutations are mutations that only exist in the tumor itself. Um, and about a quarter, a little less than that, of um, the metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer tumors have DNA repair mutations in these pathways. It's more common in metastatic disease rather than localized disease. Um, but then there are also about 12% of men who have metastatic prostate cancer who have a germline uh, mutation in one of these pathways. So that means that all of the cells in their body have this mutation, and this was something that they were born with and predisposed them to having prostate cancer. We also know that the prevalence of these mutations seems to be higher in people who have higher grade groups. So in the Gleason grade group, which gets diagnosed on the prostate biopsy or radical prostatectomy specimen. Um, those who have low Gleason grade groups of one or two seem to have a lower prevalence of having any one of these mutations. And those who have Gleason grade group three, four, and five seem to have a much higher 
um, incidence of having one of these mutations. Now, I'll, I'll go through why this is important um, because there are sort of two pathways that help cells live that we've been able to exploit to help cells, you know, prostate cancer cells die, and that's called synthetic lethality. So um, I'll start here. Um, so BRCA1 and 2 are two of the genes in this DNA repair pathway, DNA repair pathway. Um, and then PARP1, or, or we'll just use PARP for short, um, is another pathway. And together, um, if there is damage to the DNA, either one of these can uh, be used to repair the DNA. And if that happens in the cancer cell, the cell survives. Now, if you don't have PARP, but you still have BRCA1 and 2, the cell is also able to live and vice versa. If you don't have BRCA1 or 2, but you have PARP, the cell can live. Now, if you don't have BRCA1 or 2, so this would be a person who has a mutation um, in the BRCA1 or 2 gene, and we give you a drug called a PARP inhibitor that blocks this pathway, then the cell is not able to repair itself and that cell dies. So we're able to use this to preferentially kill the cancer cells um, by giving the PARP inhibitor in those uh, patients who have cancers who have this, this mutation. So in the past year, we've had uh, two therapies approved in prostate cancer um, based on success that we've seen. Um, so one is Olaparib, here's the brand name for this, Linparza, um, and the other is Rucaparib. Um, that was approved. So Olaparib was approved based on the profound study. And this is for men who have germline or somatic um, homologous recombination is just another way of uh, another way that we call sort of DNA repair mutations. Um, and these are for people who have progressed following enzalutamide or abiraterone. And then Rucaparib is only for men who have del del deleterious or pathogenic BRCA1-2 mutations and who have gotten in one of the oral agents and a taxane-based chemotherapy. Um, so for people who don't have one of these mutations, these drugs don't seem to work. So this would only be applicable for a subset of men who have one of these mutations, either that they were born with or one that only exists in their prostate cancer. And what percentage of people who come into your office uh... Have the are uh, having an opportunity for an effective PARP inhibitor play. Yeah, so ab about a quarter of men will have one of these uh, mutations that may make them uh, eligible to receive one of these therapies. So um, now we're doing genetic sequencing for all of our patients with metastatic prostate cancer because of these approvals. Um, so definitely something to talk to your doctor about. Um, you know and one to have because you do need to have the genetic testing first it, it's not something that you should you, you know we're not usually uh treating men who we we don't know if they have one of these mutations so towards the end of life kind of thing if you had like a hundred patients and well let's not make it into percentages but you got a bunch of patients in your waiting room and they all show up on the same day over time is it or is your waiting room only going to contain people who responded to PARP inhibitors? Um, so uh, not necessarily, um, you know, I mean, there are some patients, so, you know, it's not entirely clear if these uh, cancers are more aggressive, um, you know, at baseline, again, they tend to be higher Gleason scores. There's, a little bit of mixed data as to whether or not they respond better or worse to um, the first line agents. Um, but some people, you know, may respond very well to the AR targeted therapy and, and never need a PARP inhibitor or not need a PARP inhibitor for, for a very long time. Um, so we are treating, we are using PARP inhibitors sort of later down the line, not usually um, up front. And I will also say that the sort of the, usually the PARP inhibitors, even for the people who, that they, who they work in, um, seems to last for a, about six to 12 months. Um, so it's not that they're on these drugs necessarily in, indefinite or for you know, years and years and years, mm -hmm. so far at least what we've seen. 
By the way, what's the um, impact on quality of life of the PARP inhibitors? Um, so it's, uh, it's these drugs can be uh, well tolerated, although sometimes we do have to adjust the doses. Um, they are they have a side effect profile that is a little bit more similar to chemotherapy, I would say, than to the androgen-directed therapies. Um, they can cause nausea, vomiting, uh, like GI upset and diarrhea, and they can cause um, your blood counts to be suppressed. So people do have to come back in for, for monitoring, especially of their blood counts. So is, was this your last slide? Uh, no, there's one other... Um, population that I wanted to, to talk about because um, we get asked this question a lot um, and it's about checkpoint inhibitors for castration resistant prostate cancer. So um, checkpoint inhibitors are sort of the classic immune therapy that um, is being advertised a lot on TV um, and has really revolutionized cancer treatment um, for some diseases has not sort of been as efficacious in prostate cancer, but there is um, one group of patients who uh, we think does have a, a good benefit from that and would be eligible. So that's pembrolizumab or Keytruda is, is one of the drugs that's in, approved for um, anybody who has any solid tumor that has this microsatellite instability high or mismatch repair deficient tumor. So what that means is that basically your cell can't um, here you can see that your cell has some DNA damage and it can't repair itself at all. And then it makes these really abnormal proteins that then go to the surface of the cell and get recognized by the immune system as abnormal. Now, without these um, drugs, the immune system uh, just sort of says, okay, you must be a normal cell. But when we block the, that signal, then the immune system does recognize it as abnormal and then kills the cancer cells. The, um, in prostate cancer though, this is uh, actually pretty uncommon and it's only about um, less than maybe like one to 2% of, of prostate cancers. Uh, so it's, it's not very common, but for people who have this, um, immunotherapy actually probably works and can have result in like really long-term improvements um, in disease control for, for quite some time. Um, it seems in some early studies so far that about 50% of, of men with prostate cancer who have mutations in one of these uh, diseases that leads, in one of the genes that leads to this. Um, so about 50% of people will, will have a, a, a good long response uh, with, with these therapies. And with k uh, what do you see as quality of life impacts? Um, so quite good. Uh, these Keytruda actually tends to be very well tolerated. Um, the again, the side effects are totally different since this is a drug that activates the immune system. All of the side effects are autoimmune diseases. Um, so ones that we see more commonly tend to be affecting the thyroid. They can affect the GI tract um, or the skin, um, or less commonly the lungs. But they really can. Um, you know, impact any site in the body. Um, but uh, for the most part, those, the rates of serious complications are actually pretty low. I should have asked this earlier. Um, for HIV positive guys, um, the, uh, well, the Provenge and, the, and Keytruda, they're, they're not, in, you can offer them to HIV positive men? Um, so you can, um, and it seems, and we actually are doing that uh, as well. In the context of clinical trials mostly, but um, that is not necessarily uh, an exclusion. Okay, good. All right. is, is, um, or can you return to your, to your office now? Yeah. <laughs> or do you have any more slides? That was it, right? That was yeah. the last slide, yeah. No, that was good. So, I mean, it, it sort of, I mean, it does illustrate all, I mean, these are all opportunities within the last four or five years and really just offered, you know, on a global basis in the developed world, at least, uh, you know, over the last two years, let's say. Um, and I guess we're still learning about the, the real world effects of these. Um, support groups are absolutely in the front line of that because we, we have guys 
reporting back the adverse effects without any fear of whether or not their doctor may take them off the, the therapy, uh, which is a major consideration for patients, uh, not wanting to share their distress with their doctors out of fear of not getting the medications they believe will extend their lives. Let's spend a few minutes before we say goodbye uh, about um, what you think is useful for patients to share with you and what you, what agonizes you when patients aren't sharing with you. <laughs> Um, well, what's, what's agonizing is sort of what she describes when people are at home suffering and, and not telling me um, about what's going on, uh, because sometimes there are options for either managing the side effects um, with, you know, either other supportive therapies or, uh, you know, changing to an alternative regimen that, you know, we, we may think might be just as efficacious. Um, with a lower risk of side effects, or at least a different side effect profile, so that um, you know they they wouldn't necessarily be having the side effect that is that is most harmful for them. Yeah. Um, so you know all of this, uh, you, we definitely don't want people to be worse off um, with the drugs that we're giving than um, you know than they would be if we didn't give them anything at all. Um, so you know I I would suggest that people do share especially serious toxicities um, with their provider. I mean, sometimes we don't have an explanation for everything. And then there sometimes are small things that come up or, you know, new symptoms that people think are just, you know, are totally tolerable and they don't really bother them at all. And that's fine. Um, but certainly anything serious should be brought up because sometimes we can manage those symptoms um, so that they don't have to suffer through them and they can continue with the drug. Or sometimes there are different drugs that, you know, might not produce that side effect or we can just change the dose. Um, and if, you know, at a lower dose, it wouldn't necessarily be less efficacious, um, but would, you know, avoid toxicities. Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting thing because we have, do uh, we, have do we have patients who sometimes negotiate with their oncologists, like, can I have a half, you know, can I split this pill? Um, uh, there are many, uh, well, I mean, I could think of one guy who's a, uh, semi well-known artist here in New York who doesn't want the, you know, he's, he's just doesn't want the impact on what, you know, his, his, you know, joie de vie, you know, so his art doesn't suffer. And he negotiates with his doctor, like, give me half a dose, give me, let's start at a quarter dose and, and we'll just see how the PSA goes. Um, it's still okay. I mean, why, I mean, one would think a dose is a dose. Yeah, so it, it's not, um, and you know everybody metabolizes or sort of you know interacts with these drugs differently, and um, you know I mean I have sometimes I have patients who go down on the dose themselves, um, and then you know tell me about it a month or two later um, because of side effects, and then they say you know I had this side effect when we were at full doses, and I went down to half dose, and I don't have these side effects anymore, um, and and that's you know, good, because I definitely, again, I don't want you, I don't want people to be suffering at, at home with side effects. Um, I mean, usually we start most of these drugs at the full dose, and then if there are side effects, we go down. Um, but the other way is also totally appropriate, where you can start at a lower dose, especially depending on the, the side effect profile of, of that drug. You can start at a lower dose and see if you tolerate it, um, and then you know gradually go up or just decide to stay at a half a dose, see if your PSA goes down. Um, again, because you know we don't medicine is not that individualized yet, where we don't know exactly what the right dose is for everybody, and there is some variation um, around that. So certainly, some people still get a great PSA response and are on the lowest dose possible of a drug. Um, so that is definitely something that you know can and should be individualized and, and discussed with your doctor um, so that you're not having, you know, excessive toxicity from these drugs. Yeah. What, what are like the most useful questions that you ask your patients? You mean related to toxicities? Related to anything. I mean, you have a, a got, let's say a guy uh, with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. Uh, you're seeing him for the first time, sits in front of you, spouser, no spouse, he's there, you know, you're face to face. Uh, what do you want to know about this guy? 
Um, so I usually ask people, you know, sort of what their normal life is and what's important for them in their normal life and what they want to be able to do. So, you know, people, for example, who want to travel a lot and aren't going to be in Baltimore often, you know, those are patients. So I say, okay, you know, chemotherapy is not going to fit into your lifestyle um, because you have to be back here every three weeks. So, you know, again, I try and get to know who the, the patient is and, and what's important to them and the kind of life that they're desiring to live um, and then try and tailor the therapies and, and pick the therapies that would, um, you know, maximize their ability to do that. And, you know, not to end this on a terribly morbid or sad note, but, you know, patients are curious about their doctor's response to them. What, what's it like for you when you learn that a patient has died? Um, so, you know, I mean, honestly, it, it depends, um, you know, again, on how expected or unexpected um, that death is. Um, you know, sometimes I I mean, I certainly have patients who, uh, you know, before they they die are, are very ready to die and, and are at are peace with that. Um, some who may have been suffering and are, you know, everyone is sort of relieved that they're not suffering anymore and they've, you know, come to terms with sort of where they are. Um, you know, obviously any unexpected deaths or deaths that happen earlier than um, I would have predicted or, or shocking. I, you know, always uh, try and reach out to the families of, of my patients after they've died to, you know, to just um, let them know that I'm, I'm still here for, for the, the patient family, um, you know, as they, as they go through that. So it, it can be difficult. Um, and, you know, obviously we're, we're in this to try and um, improve people's lives and, and try and extend life. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, we're not always able to do that indefinitely for everybody. Yeah. Dr. Marshall, thank you for being part of our conference. Thank you for an interesting conversation and a motivating conversation, I think. Um, yeah, and, and thank you for caring for your patients as, as well as you do. Uh, that helps everyone in our community uh, throughout the world. Um, Welcome to the conference. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for the for the invitation and it was so nice to talk to you today.